Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Above the Bar podcast. For each week, we belly up to the bar with a new guest, find out what they do, who they are, and what makes them great. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. All righty, folks, welcome back to the Above the Bar podcast. It's your host, Sean. We've bellied up to the bar today. We are ready to go. We have brought with us a mystic of the man's mind, <laughs> uh, a wanderer for women to make men wonder why. Uh, <laughs> let's see what else I can come up with. Um, I don't know. I'm already having a good time, though. Look at this. A, a, a gentleman's gent who will gently guide you <clears throat> Through your gilded days. I, I oh, I like that one. That's a lot of G's. I That's made good. that all happen. We were bellied up to the bar today on uh, this October 19th. And, and Doc, I'm going to apologize. We, we we got my partner, Dibs, is back today. But we have with us Dr. Avram. 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 See, I told Doc I was going to butcher That's my name. uncle said when I was born. It's like a drink of rum. Oh, look at that. Of rum. Listen, there you go. That, that's right. Bar. There you go. That, that's that's right. something you can relate to. You like that segue? You like that? I like that. Look, it's, we'll just have a little rum, and then, then we'll just sit down, and we'll have a good time. It'll be perfect. So, but we have the good doctor with us. Doc, welcome to the Thank Above you. the Bar podcast. Good to be here. Uh, oh, where's my? See, and I'm, I'm already messing things up for you, Doc. This is. Let me fix myself here. I'm gonna fix myself, and we'll do this one more time. You get a new knee part, and you can't figure out your soundboard. I, look. I was supposed to give you cheers and everything. I did, and Dibs is right. I got my uh, ace. For those of you that are follow me in all my parts of life, is I had my ACL replaced on Thursday, last Thursday. Ouch. You know, though, everybody, and we'll talk about doctors for a moment. Everybody talks about all oh, the VA, this, that, and the other. I'm going to tell you, it's no different than any other hospital in any other city. That Your city is going to have great and amazing hospitals in one part of it. And then there's going to be other hospitals that suck. And we happen to luck out here in the Albany area. The doctor that did my ACL surgery has been doing it for 30 years. Great. So it's like, yeah, what do you like? There was no, no place for me to complain and be like, oh, how horrible could this guy be? He's been doing it for 30 years. If he can't figure it out by now, I'm, I'm definitely not the person he's going to all of a sudden magically get it right yep. with. So, Doc, before we get going too far into this, and, and folks, for those of you that are listening, we're talking about, um, and, and Doc, correct me if I say it wrong, but we're talking about how men are afraid of women. No, you got it. You got you know, it. it. It's a, it's pretty much as simple as that. Um, and definitely, I have a lot of questions. Um, Good. That, that it's, a, it's a unique thing. Like, it's a lot of, and a lot of it, I feel like, is cultural. It's like, like culture tells us this is the way we're supposed to be. So we'll get into all that. Yeah, but absolutely. But before we get too far um, and look, I know my Raven stickers over there and I'm ready to fire everyone on the coaching staff right now. Oh, let's go giants. Oh, giants can. Oh God. I'm a giants fan. Sorry. Oh God. Ugh. And just like that, folks, the show's over. <laughs> go, go find oh, perfect. God, it was so horrible. But, uh, yeah. but, well, somebody said to me, oh, I can't believe the Giants are 5-1. and one. I'm like, they're just playing consistent, well-coached football. There's, they're, they're, there's two people on the entire team that are, that are worth, you know, greatness. And everybody else is just playing their role, which is all you ever really want. And um, it's amazing. But getting it into this real quick, as you can see, the big sticker board over my right shoulder, mm -hmm. that's sticker and a cause, folks. If you've got something you're supporting, maybe you're a doctor and you've got some books and you want to get them out there. You've got a, your own podcast, band, liquor. I don't care what it is. Reach out to me on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, TikTok, even our email address. It's all the above the bar podcast. And that's at gmail.com for our email address. Send me a message. Let me know what you got. I'll give you the address where to send the sticker. You mail me out a sticker. And we'll read all about it right here on the air. You can ask Dibs. He sent me stickers before he I let him be my co-host, and we read about them on the air. So make sure you send those out to us. And maybe your media is feeling scared of other media, and your media needs to understand that it's good enough, it's nice enough, and gosh darn it, people like it. 
you might want to reach out to Media by Dibs. That's my partner here to my right, Media by Dibs. You can find him on Facebook and uh, Instagram at Media by Dibs, D-I-B-S. Or you can go ahead and uh, reach out to him on LinkedIn at Andrew Dibble, D-I-B-B-L-E. No S. I always want to put an S at the end of his name. But D-I-B-B-L-E. And you can reach out to him there. And my wife won't come on the camera, but she just brought me water. See, I'm not scared of her. Only, only if she raises a hand at me. That's normally when it is. She, look, now she's sneaking over on camera. Hey there. <laughs> See, she's the scary one. But And those of you that are jo just joining us and just finding us, if you're finding us through uh, the Good Doctors post, which I appreciate your email that went out there, Doc. Uh, oh, look at that. Da David Cannon, you're in uh, you're in Saugerties. We were just in Saugerties for the Garlic Festival. Love your Garlic Festival. But uh, I will tell you, you got to come up this way to the Bennington one, Dave. If you haven't done uh, the Bennington Garlic Festival, it's just about as good as Saugerties. Just um, Saugerties is the second largest in the world behind the one in California. It's massive. But the food, I will give, I'll give Saugerties this. The food at Saugerties is uh, pretty impressive. Like, like there's a fat kid that lives in my soul that loves it. See, I'm sad I never got to go any of Like, I never went to any of that stuff when I lived out there. Well, well Doc, you're up in Maine, aren't you? Yes, sir. Now, I mean, there's some pretty good – you got some pretty good uh, spots up there. Uh, Portland, Maine. Oh, yeah, big food town. Like huge, monstrous. That's actually uh, considered as one of the best food cities in America. Yeah, it is. And I'm it's a little like, ways away from Portland. I live in an island in Penobscot Bay. Now, where's that at? Uh, about an, almost two hours north of Portland is Rockland, and then you take a ferry from Rockland out to Vinyl Haven, which is where I live. That's called Canada, Doc. <laughs> Not quite. It's still way north of Canada. <laughs> Close to <laughs> two hours north of Maine is called Canada. Nah, you got a ways to go. Oh, you're just God. southern Canada, Sean. I don't. I don't know what you're yeah. talking. I'm super southern Canada. I have to cross the bridge, and I'm in Canada. Well, I was about to say, isn't Canada south of where you're at? <laughs> Who? Because in Michigan, Michigan is the only place where yeah you, have, it, you can it, get it, into it, Canada yeah. by going south. Yeah. So I thought you were up there, but yeah, Dave, I'll, I'll tell you, brother, it is definitely, definitely uh, good eating out there in Saugerties. So, Doc, all the house cleaning is done. All the prep yeah. prep work is over with. Yeah. I, I want to say it again. Thank you for coming out. I've been looking forward to talking. Yeah, to you. Me too. Uh, it, so I'll tell you where we could jump in. Yes, please. The joke you just made to your wife. about yeah, Let's go with it. Go from there. Because people <laughs> only joke like that about things they're scared of. I'm, I'm deaf. I would admit to being scared of my wife. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My experience with men is it goes almost the same exact way every single time. So when you first hear the idea that men are scared of women, it's just like a weird counterintuitive. So with, it goes very differently with men and women with men. The first response is they bow up immediately that oh, I'm not scared of her. Scared and then within 60 seconds, you can just see it come over like a look of like, Huh. That would explain a lot. But let's define that fear. Sure. Because I think if I, you know, Dibs and I were both in the Marine Corps. So if you told me I was scared, I appreciate it. If you told Thank us we you. were scared, I, I think sure. physically scared. It, are we talking physical? No, or are we talking we're more not emotional? talking physically scared. We are talking emotionally scared. And I can give you a very simple everyday example that most guys can relate to you're at work and your buddies come over and say hey we're gonna go out to the bar after work and watch uh giants game you want to come with us and for most guys what's the first thought that comes to their mind i gotta um, go ask my wife exactly now what's interesting about that now what's sad about that is that the first thought that comes to your mind is whether or not your wife's going to be mad at you before you even wonder whether or not you'd like to go out with your friends. That's sad. Okay. The first thought should be whether or not you want to do it, not whether or not your mommy is okay with it. The second thing that's interesting about that is that from the woman's point of view, most women are very happy for you to go out with your friends. In fact, they may have been pestering you. Why don't you go out and make some friends and quit pestering me all the time? So it's, it's an imagined fear. It's not, it's not coming from any, reality in the relationship it comes from the place that i'm talking about and the place i'm writing about and it's just a, a you know you immediately went there tips you got it immediately and most guys do 
And that's coming from us, not them. But okay. But what is what is that fear though? Is it being in past, you know, because I think about something like that and I would say, well, it probably comes from past relationships where you thought it was okay and you were younger and you wanted to do all those things and, and experience all that. And like a, like a beat dog, you know, like that whole Pavlovian theory, you know, right. you beat them enough when we think it's time to go do that and we want to go do those things. We can't. Well, you yeah, right. immediately have immediately has that negative connotation that yeah. well, if I do this, I'm going to get in trouble. Type You're deal. right. When you say past relationships, only you're about thirty years ahead. So, so you're talking like motherly. You got it. Yep. Um, so uh, there's a there's a wonderful social psych experiment. I wish we had the technology. I would show you the video. I mean, I'm sure there's a way to do it. I don't know how to do it. But if you if you listeners Google the still face experiment, S T I L L, it's a famous social psych experiment. They took moms and their babies, little little babies. And they did a split screen so you can see the mom's face like I'm seeing you and Tibbs next to each other now. And there, and you can see that there is a conversation between the two. It's obviously not verbal because they're babies. But the mom makes a face and the baby responds. And so that's reinforcing to the mom. Oh, the baby likes that face. So the mom makes more of it. Or the baby does a little cute thing and the mom smiles. So they're, they're learning about each other without words. And they are, most importantly, they're they're validating and reinforcing each other. Because if you try something, if I tell a joke and you laugh, then that validates me. You like me. I'm okay with you. So in the experiment, they ask the moms to turn away and then turn back with a still face. Not an angry face, not a critical face, just to not respond to the baby. And within minutes, all of the babies were crying screaming. Some of them actually lost control of their bodies and their bowels, right? That's how upsetting it is to babies. Not when their moms are angry at them, but just when their moms are not reciprocating with them. Now, some interesting to bring that to us here today. First of all, the boy babies got more physiologically distressed than the girl babies and their distress lasted longer. They get more upset and it took them longer to recover. And then you come to grownups and we see an interesting fact. In conflict between men and women in heterosexual relationships, guess who gets more upset and guess who stays upset longer? Well, I'm going to say it's men based on this, got it. <laughs> this right. conversation. Good assumption. <laughs> it's the same thing. So that the reason that these fears exist is that we as men, when we, if we're straight, and we're marrying a woman, it recreates those early dynamics with our mother. So if you're, if you're a gay man or you're a woman, you're not marrying your mother. But if you're a straight guy, you end up with the same feelings you had. So guys are notorious. I'll give you all more everyday examples. Guys are notorious for, first of all, avoiding conflict at all costs in relationships. And second of all, trying to keep the emotional tone as low as possible, as controlled and moderated as possible. And it's the same. It's the same. Why are they avoiding conflict? Because conflict is threatening. If she gets, she might leave me. She might get so mad at me, she might leave me. So I have to keep things calm. And yeah, I feel and like I don't know that. that yeah, I feel like that's the... Uh... I'm going to go with Dave for a second, though. Hold on a second. Dave says, that sounds like an awful experiment. Child abuse, JK. Well, yeah, you absolutely could not do that experiment today. No. Back in the, they wouldn't let you do it. Today. But, but think about it. You know, we're saying it's awful. All the mom did was not respond for a moment. And it was devastating to the kids. She wasn't mean. But what? I mean, so think, think about it from like our point of view. Like if you do get into an argument with a spouse or the significant yeah. other or whatever, one of the worst that like one of the things that really is just just nothing. Not I mean, sure. it's the, the the typical I'm fine straight face, and you're like, mind. nope, like absolutely not, because you need that you ever, affirmation, you ever, like that acknowledgement. That went, there was a video that went viral. I think I'm trying to remember it was like Good Housekeeping magazine or some odd person put this video out called the the Dog House. Did you ever see this video? No. 
Mm-mm. So a guy, it's their, it's either their anniversary or her birthday, and he's all excited. He got her a gift, and he brings it in, and it's a vacuum cleaner. Uh, his wife uh, walks him outside to the doghouse, the literal doghouse, and puts him inside, and he goes down in a chute where he's <laughs> goes down into like purgatory with all the other men who gave their wife, and they're down there folding laundry. And they've all been sent there for their insensitivity. And they have to stay until they figure out what they did wrong. And <laughs> millions of people watch this video. I, I'm with, I'm with uh, Cujo. I'm fine equals nuclear level Cold War tone. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and you know what, though? You, you bring up such a great point. I can't tell you how many times, you know, you, you're in an argument with your spouse, whatever's going on, and as a man, I want to finish the conversation. I start things, I finish it, let's finish the conversation. And you get silent, leave me alone. I don't want to talk. And that is just brutal. Oh, it's a dagger. I, I would rather you scream at me at that point. Yes. Like, why is, no, it, let's, let's, why yeah. is that so hard for men? Because of what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I, that, that's the only thing I, we, I can come up with. Men don't admit to themselves how much we need women. And so when women withdraw their affection, their approval, we're a mess, but we don't understand why. Well, I mean, it's like you look at the ultimate like thing, even when going back to the whole mom conversation and going, the I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Is such a like bigger dagger to the heart that it's just yeah. And, and, yeah. yeah. With with kids, we say uh, if mom ain't happy, nobody's happy. And then when we get to be grown ups, we say happy wife, happy life. So, so this becomes the question in all this. Then, a- as we're getting into this, and folks, if you're just joining us, uh, the good doctor has has a website. Let me run that banner. I almost forgot to run it for you there, doc. Uh, and a Avram, 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 Avram Weiss, PhD.com. I butcher names. Everybody knows it. It's nothing That's personal. Right. I, I am horrible with names. Um, make sure you're going on, you're checking out what he's got going on. His, his books are over there. Uh, studies he's been involved in are over there. And we're discussing why men are scared of women, why we have this. It, but as I'm listening to this and I'm, and I'm thinking about, where a lot of this comes from why is it the same thing with why isn't it the same thing with daughters and fathers because almost all of us were raised by women not men because our primary our first powerful emotional attachment was with a woman whether you're a boy or a girl it's changing finally kind of a little bit and dads are getting more involved, thank God. You know, I'm a little older than you guys. When I had my kids, um, there was a joke when I had my kids in the, in the uh, mid-80s. And that was, what do you call a dad on a Saturday? If you see a dad in the park on a Saturday with his kids, what do you call, what do you call that? Single. Divorced. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because the idea that, that a that a dad in an intact family was just unheard of. You never saw dads. Um, I remember the first time I saw a changing table in a McDonald's men's room. It was a huge, because I'd been changing my kids' diapers on on dirty bathroom sinks. Yep. And I remember the first time McDonald's, but it was a huge like watershed moment. So back to your question, Girls don't have the same intensity of relationship with their dad because they don't rely on their dads the way boys rely and boys and girls rely on their moms. Dads in most families are kind of the role player, the secondary, the ancillary. So there's not that you don't you might be close to your dad, but you don't need your dad the way you need your mom. That's there's nothing biological about that. And there's no reason it can't change. But that is the way it is in our culture. It's more so it's more of a cultural thing. Absolute. Learned. So absolutely. do you do you see do you see that difference? I mean, obviously in a lot of cultures it is I mean, if, if you look at like African tribes and stuff, a lot of times it is a women raising that. But I mean, do you see is there a culture that comes to mind that does have that dynamic 
flip-flopped to where they don't see it as much? Well, if, if I were in a really optimistic mood, I would say our culture is getting there. And I'll, I'll tell you my, my very anecdotal evidence is uh, my son has twin three-year-olds. And when I visit him, and there's a group of young parents together and their kids, the thing that warms my heart more than anything else is when a kid starts crying or needing attention, every man in the room gets up and the women sit there and keep talking and drinking their shabli while the men get up and go take care of the kids. And that is the most hopeful thing I have seen. And what I always tell the guys, you know, guys, like, for example, the issue about getting up in the middle of the night, you know, guys bitch and moan. I don't want to get up. I have to go to work. And I'm like, you are missing the biggest opportunity of your life because the middle of the night is the only time you get unsupervised time with your children. We lost the dibs. Oh my goodness. And we did. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, he'll, he'll, if he can I get back, he, he's in Michigan with like his internet is ran by squirrels. So oh, okay. it happens. Okay. So, so, and Cujo just jumped in with, this is like, like two generations ago, hearing that term, wait till your dad gets home and, and instill in the fear that your, your father was going to be this, massive disciplinarian right I, i'm gonna play a little devil's advocate though sure. with this which is are we losing though a, and and i'll say it for men and women that and everybody likes this term toxic masculinity which i don't really quite fully understand it because at the same time someone will say toxic masculinity um there's an expectation that on a date, a man is going to pay for that. Right. But if you, if you don't pay for it, somehow you're lesser of a, of a person. Right. You're, you're, if you told, if you told a woman, well, no, you, you can pay for that. You know, uh, all, all, all these different things, you're lesser. If somebody came up and, you know, hit on your, your girlfriend while you're out and you didn't just instantaneously go to throwing hands all of a sudden you're again, you're less of a right. man. What you didn't defend her honor. It's very confusing. So right. So so where is speak, that line at? Let me speak to the term uh, toxic masculinity because you're absolutely right. There, there's actually a wonderful debate I'm in the middle of now with colleagues. Um, I'm reading your the line here. That's yep. wonderful. It's wonderful. You feel it, that it way. Says, or not this, but Cujo says yeah. he loves to hear when his his That's daughter right. calls out daddy instead yeah, of mom. There's no better feeling in the world. Absolutely, I agree with him a hundred percent. So in the field, we're actually moving away from the term toxic masculinity because it has such negative connotations. And we're moving more to terms like traditional masculinity. And so what that is talking about is um, women or girls are raised. When a girl is born, she identifies as a girl and doesn't feel insecure about that at all. She's a girl because she was born a girl. And she doesn't feel like she has to prove it or defend it or anything. It's very different for men. Hundred percent. Right. Boys are taught that, first of all, masculinity, that there isn't a thing called masculinity. Mostly what masculinity means is not feminine. Okay. And so then boys feel like they have to always be on guard to not appear to be feminine in any way, shape, or form because they will be thought of as less masculine. Right. That's what they're talking about, traditional. So there's a wonderful story um, about a little boy in kindergarten or first grade. And, and his, the teacher says that the, at the end of the year, everybody gets to lead the class in the song that we learned this year that you like the best. Great. Little boy gets up in front of the class and he starts singing a lullaby. At which point, all the other boys in the class start making faces and humiliating and making fun of him. So he doesn't get very far into the song before he sees his friends making fun of him. He says, I was just kidding. I was just teasing. I don't like that song. And he starts singing the Marine Corps anthem. Aha. I like the kid already. Right. That's a lullaby. But a lullaby. even at, at six years old, he understood the disapproval that would come to him if he said he liked a song that the other boys judged to be feminine. And so he lied and put on a false front to say what he liked was what he thought they would like. And again, Cujo, hence 20 years ago, one of the worst things you could say to another guy was they were gay, totally yeah. wrong, shameful. I, yeah. I didn't know better back then. And, and we all used it. Heck, there was a time when just using the term gay 
didn't actually mean homosexual. Right. You would just look at something and be like, instead of calling something stupid, it right. was like, dude, that's gay. Like, what do you do? That thing, you wear those, that's gay. And it, and it was used just as a, a term. Mm -hmm. Now, but now, I don't know when that story, you know, when that's supposed to be taking place, but I almost recently. feel like. Recently. Okay. Because I don't, I almost feel like today, you, a boy who acts too much in that, in that vein of like, Hey, I like baseball. I like football. I, 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 I like these. I want to go hunting. I like these more masculine things. They're almost, there's an entire group of people that will shame them for that on the other side of it, because to say, well, how dare you? You're, you're too yeah. much. this way. I, I think that's more what we'd like to think happens. I don't think it is what happens. So the, the story I told you is from a book called When Boys Become Boys. And it's a woman who spent a researcher. She's an interesting woman, but she's a psychologist and a congresswoman from California. Oh, wow. uh, Judy Chu is her name. Okay. And um, not only did she study, she, she basically lived in that classroom for a few years and studied these kids very closely. But it was a Quaker school. Oh, and wow. So, the parents were all about not gender stereotyping their kids. Like the kids weren't allowed to play with guns in the class. But as soon as the teacher turned her back, the, kid, the boys started making guns out of the Legos. They're going to do that. Right. So yeah, that, so their parents didn't want them to do it and the school didn't want them to do it. But their culture shapes them to do it. It's, it's just such an interesting way of learning because – one of the other things I read through some of your articles is you talk about how men do better in relationships and women do do worse. What what do you like? I, I guess, you know, I think about partnerships and in any partnership, one can do better than the other. But you're you're saying that statistically the studies show that this is how it works. Yes. What is the reasoning behind some of that? Well, before I, before I get to the reason, what's interesting about that is that. The stereotype is that marriage works better for women than men. So we say things like, you know, um, why, why would, you know, you know, mom will tell her daughter, you know, don't have sex with a guy because, you know, if he can get the milk for free, he won't buy the cow. And so we have all this stuff. The stereotypes are that men, that women pursue men and try to get them to marry because marriage is good for women and that men try to stay single as long as possible because marriage is going to make, they'll be less happy, but the opposite is true. But what, so I, Why? I think, but like, well, this is my thoughts on, on the male part of it is we're always looking to be protectors, providers. Yes. We, we, we want to be that person. That's what we are taught to be. And we benefit from a relationship in that where we're absent doing those things to provide for that. And I looked think, at in that. Yeah, way. I think men do better in marriage. Yes. Um, because, um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start the answer a little further back. Yes. So, um, boys and girls originally start out playing together, and then at some age, the girls start playing with the girls, and the boys start playing with the boys. What do the boys play? The boys play games to help them learn how to run the world. They play games, competition and aggression. So I remember we played football. We played cops and robbers. We played basketball. We played wiffle ball. All games that taught us how to compete with other guys. Absolutely. 100%. What were girls playing? Uh, games to teach them how to take care of a household. How Take care of a household and learn about relationships. They play doctor. They play house. They play school. They're playing games and learning about relationships. So then years go by and we get back together and who knows more about relationships? It's not even close. The girls know a lot more about relationships. And so the reason men do better in relationships is, in marriages, is that men are not so good at relationships by and large. No. And we need women. If we're going to have an intimate relationship, it's more likely to be with a woman. If we're going to learn about closeness, it's probably going, whereas women, and also because most men don't have any close friends, 
So women have lots of close friends and don't rely entirely on their husband for intimacy. And they already know about how to be close with other people. So the, the classic story is the guy who gets divorced and he thinks, well, I'm, I'm rid of her, you know, now I'm going to all, all the stuff I want in my life. And then he looks around and he's alone because all his friends are the husbands of his wife's friends. And when they go away, he finds out he actually doesn't have any friends. I wrote an article about men and loneliness that has almost a million views on psychology today. Where, where could we find it? It's in on psychology today.com. You put in my name on psychology today.com. You'll find the article, but I mean, think about, you know, it obviously it touched a nerve. A million people read that. article. Absolutely. I'm, I'm just even hearing it. Yeah. You know, I, I think about that and I, I've known folks like that. And yeah. I think, you know, I, I, I do feel like I'm lucky that, the people that I have in my life, male friends wise, but I, I have my fraternity. I have the Marine right. Corps. That's I, right. I built those, but a lot of, I think a lot of men outside of that, if you don't have that fraternity. Well, that's a have- really good point. And I think that is a lot of what appeals to people about the military because it, it's one of the few places where men forge those kind of close lifelong relationships is the military. And I think that's part of what the appeal is. Oh, I got friends that could pick up the phone, and I know Dibs does too, that could pick up the phone right now and either ask for money or to bury a body, and I got to go. And so, most, no, I mean, you, you're you one of them. I mean, it, it, it comes down to that. I'm supposed <laughs> to know about burying the body. <laughs> right. But no, no, but, absolutely. But with and most I mean, men, that's not true. The question I ask of men often is, it's a two-part question, because I'll say, do you have friends? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure, I have friends. And then then it's the follow-up because I'll say, well, do you have friends that you talk with about the things you talk with me about? Oh, hell no. Now that's different. Yeah. I've probably, what do you think? Do you have anybody? Like I know I've maybe got one, one to two, two that I probably could really, but even then it would be like, it would be tough to get into that conversation. I think two friends. I've got two. Yeah, I've got I, I two and both, both of them I was in the military with. Like, I it's, think uh, and, two puts you yeah. both way ahead of the curve. Yeah. But, but both it, men like, have no one in their lives they talk to but their wives. No. But, see, but I think there's a bond. Like, So the one that I uh, talk to is, I mean, my kids call him uncle. Like, I mean, we, we deployed together. We, I mean, he's, he's as close. And then the other one is someone that we drove to North Carolina to New York. I don't know how many times that we just got to know each other. And I think when you're in a car, you, you kind of, sure. you got sure. nothing else to talk about. So, I mean, him and I got really close. But let me tell you a story about this, which I think you'll appreciate. Um, I, I run therapy groups for men and I started my first one about 12 years ago. And I remember standing in the room outside the room where the group was going to be and thinking, this is the worst idea I've ever had in my life. These guys are going to talk about sports They're going to talk about work. It's going to be so superficial. I was 180 degrees wrong. The groups I do for men are the most intimate, the most committed. Within a couple of months, the members of that group were hugging at the end of the group, talking about how much they loved each other. And what I learned, which I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know, is all the stereotypes about men, you know, not wanting to open up and not are complete bullshit. Men are dying to talk to each other. They just are scared to do it in front of women. Yeah, no, I would agree. With yeah, that. no, absolutely. And, and do you, I didn't know that. Now, do you feel like in those groups, as I'm hearing this, do you feel like the men become very protective of each other? Oh, yeah. In that very tribal, in that tribal sense of it, like, hey, I know what I know what Dibs is going through. And some, uh, and if somebody even within the group were to say something like, hey, man, you know that ain't right. You know he's got this going on. I would say they're protective, but but not to the point where it stops them from challenging each other. Mm-hmm. You know, and saying, you know, saying to, to somebody, um, you know, you can do better. You know, the, the way you're talking to your wife is not working. You need to step it up. You need to um, be more open with her. You need to, you know, you need to up your game. You need to be there. And we're getting some great comments, you know, 
T- Cujo is my is one of my close friends. It's Tom. Tom and I probably talk. God, I couldn't tell you how many times a day we talk about something. Normally, it's him sending me a Star Wars meme of some sort, <laughs> but uh, and me going, oh, I saw that one, or, or me telling him like, you need to go watch this show or right. complaining about something. But we do. We talk. We've had a lot of, and I've said it a hundred times. He's a guy that, through conversation, has changed political views for me. Yep. Um, but uh, Dave Cannon, Dave says. Uh, up until a few years ago, he had a few friends, including one woman he could talk to about anything. And that's that's amazing because I'm thinking about it, you know, as a young boy, um, there was one. There was one other boy that I could talk to. And even then, it was difficult. Well, that's the tragedy. That's the tragedy because the research shows us that boys' friendships with other boys are just as close as girls' friendships with other girls when they're boys, and that they're just as important to boys, but then we get talked out of it, you know, and we get distracted by going off and conquering the world, and we forget about the importance of relationships until something happens in our lives when we, like, we get divorced, or we get sick, or we go bankrupt, and we really need somebody, and we look around, and, and they're not there. I mean, this is just uh, it, it's wild to me. And you also talked talk in your book about in in your research about divorce, which I, I've been divorced twice personally. Um, and I'm going to tell you, this is going to piss a lot of men off. I would have to look at all the statistics on it and all the math and the numbers and all those kind of things. But I'm going to tell you, Doc, I cried bullshit when it, when when I read that men do financially better inter, 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 or divorce than women do. Because me personally, I'm looking at it and going, thinking about the money that comes out of my pocket and friends' pockets. And, you know, I used to work on the railroad where men have very good jobs. And you talk to a guy and he's like, yeah, I'm dropping $2,200 a month in child support for one kid. You know, yeah. you're, you're hearing these crazy numbers. And if you, here in New York, the way the system is put put together, it actually is designed where it's not financially beneficial for the person who's gaining child support to increase their station in life. You're, you're mixing together two things. That's I'm, what I wanted to. That's what I wanted to talk about. Am yeah. I missing it? How? What am I missing here? Well, I don't. I'm, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but but it is still true that women's standard of living goes down after divorce, and men's standard of living tends to go up. So that's just across everyone. So there's no question. I mean, divorce, you have to understand divorce is a hardship for men and women because you're taking instead of two people, you know, you're, you're setting up two households. So nobody comes out of a divorce thinking they did well. No, everybody comes no. out of the divorce feeling they got hosed. Men and women. The only Nobody's person that was a lawyer. The lawyer, oh, yeah, right? That's true. that's true. The lawyers don't feel. The lawyers don't feel like shit. That. Sorry about that, man. I Just keep getting the lawyers, man. <laughs> As you get into your 2009 Kia with not a single piece of power equipment, and they roll roll off in their uh, BMW 750 right. Li, and you're like, they're like, man, it's the best. If of you court. really want to be, look up sometime what percentage of women end up living below the poverty line after divorce. It's shocking. Give me that number, Dibs. I don't, I don't know the number, but it's a number. big number. Did this job, Doc. That's okay. this job. Can you throw that? I've, he, I've got that, a new job now. I like it. I like it now that my job. squirrels are now that my squirrels are back to life. They're I'm back go to life. Them. I told you, job, that's man. what happens when you're nor- north of Canada. Oh, and you have to I think so what horrible. happens is men men often think about the money that they earn as their money, and so when women get child support, it feels to the guy like he's giving her money that's really his. So, but I would say what they're doing is they're sharing the responsibility of the children that they had together. Oh, that's the whole thing. So, uh, <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> I can't talk because you're, you're like, like, I, I feel like just, meat in the cage. You yeah. really are. Cause I'm, cause I've, I've gone down this road so many times, like, and I know New York state well enough where they say things like, Hey, if she spends the entire child support on 
clothing for herself because that's enough. She needs that so that she can go to work to continue earning enough for their household. It's a whole thing. I don't, I don't want to get all into that, but yeah. So what's the, because Dibs and I were talking about this earlier. Is there an age as parents that we should be looking out for our sons and daughters? I feel like to, to kind of, to pay attention, like, Hey, this is that transition phase. Is it the puberty? What, where where does that phase start it's to transition? In sad to say, it looks to be around kindergarten, first grade. That really um, that early. Yeah. That, is, that there, is there anything? I don't. I don't want to say preventing, but like, is there? Like, obviously, we're looking out for that change. I mean, is there? I don't know how to phrase it. Like to to yeah. do it differently. The yeah. problem is that it, most of it happens outside of our awareness. So if you if you um, have kids who play sports, right? So you go to a kid's soccer game. Let's say it's seven-year-old kids, five-year-old, seven-year-old kids, and a boy falls down. I guarantee you that the parents will say some version of, get up, get up, get back in the game. Yeah. But, even more know. importantly, yeah. what happens is if you watch the kid when he falls down, he'll before he reacts, he'll look to the sideline to get his cue from his parents. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's that thing where they tell you, like, if you overreact when your kid falls yes. down, that's yes. why they tell you, like, oh, if your kid falls down to something like laugh. That's right. Because so with boys, we tend to say, get up, get back in there. And with girls, we tend to go, oh. And so we're right there. We're training the girls differently than we're training the boys god we don't even know we're doing it we don't even realize we're doing it but if you go to a game and you watch you'll see the parents react differently when the girls yep. get hurt than the boys yep because we were raised that way and so it's very hard to not do it yourself dave i wasn't picking on your car bro i drove a 2007 nissan titan <laughs> up until a year ago until the wheels fell off of that thing drive drive it till it falls apart Nobody can afford cars no more. I don't blame you one bit. But now, devil's advocate again. I got to be devil's advocate with some of this. Fine. Going back to the, I love that you use the term traditional instead yes. of toxic. Yes. But don't we need for, for men because of there are times when we, you know, culturally we are expected yes. to provide that traditional sure. male. The, the difference do do is, the difference is, it's um, it's about rigidity versus flexibility. So, ideally, everybody would be able to develop all parts of themselves, and so the healthy person is the person who can step up and be strong and traditional sometimes, and be open and vulnerable and intimate other times. The problem comes when we you know, there's the expression, the man box, you know, when we say this is how men are, and you're not allowed to be outside of that. That's when it becomes a problem. So it's not that there's anything wrong with traditional men. Look, if, if I'm going to war, I want a traditionally masculine guy at the head of my platoon. I, I don't want to stop and talk about my feelings. <laughs> right. But okay. then I'm not feeling this war. I'm not feeling. Right. right. But then. <laughs> After, when we get back to base camp and I lost my best friend, then I don't want to be a tough, stoic asshole. I want to have a friend I can talk to about it. There is a phenomenal book I, I will recommend. And I don't know if you ever read it or not, Deb. Shadow of the Sword. Mm -hmm. you chance, Doc. Did you read it, Dibs? Yep. That, th this is exactly what you're talking about that for us. Yeah. Is Shadow of the Sword, he was a, I can't remember if he's a Flying Cross or Bronze Star with a V winner. Um, might even been a Silver Star. But goes through, saves all these other Marines, does all these things, and never communicates his his trauma, right. of the experiences, and goes down a very deep, deep, dark hole and almost ruins an entire career, a right. wife, kids, everything. So and and that's actually not how war was always fought. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Achilles in Vietnam. And it's written by a guy who's a psychiatrist and a classic scholar. And he talks about war in the time of Achilles and Agamem Agamemnon. 
And the way they fought a battle then was they fought during the day. And then when it got close to dark, the fighting stopped and each side went out. And if your friend was wounded or killed, you brought your friend back between behind the lines and you cared for him or cleaned his body before burying him. The combat stopped and people tended to the emotional wounds of combat. Then they went back the next day and started the war again. It's how it used to go. And he makes, um, you know, Robert Bly, the big men's rights guy? Yes. Bly wrote a, an article about this before he was a poet and all that. And he said what changed it all was the helicopter. Because before the helicopter, when somebody yelled charge, when the officer in charge yelled charge, he was in the front of the line. Yep. And the helicopter meant that he could be up there and tell you to charge while he sat in a safe distance. So true. God, that's so true. How many times on a patrol did you ever see a colonel, you know, right up, right up there with you? But it used to oh, be. Yeah. That's how yeah. it used to be. You, you don't. And that's why you get things like you get movies like um, We Were Soldiers, where the, mm -hmm. I think he was a colonel in that yep. thing, where first boots on the ground and last boots. Like it's such a rarity that it's it, that's the type of leader you want. And it's such a rarity to see it. And then you don't see it anymore and if you do then they get their silver stars with v's they get their all that stuff and it's right. yeah it, it's it's very different so how do we so I, and, and maybe i'm asking you know the great question that that doesn't have quite an answer yet here yes so how do we make that transition or or create that that right. bridge where we can still have those traditional like i can't even I, maybe you got one dibs like i don't know of a of you know maybe uh liam neeson would be like the only hollywood character that i could think of where you know he is the strong traditional male character in so many movies but also has like the mm -hmm. loving side like because it ain't john wayne Right. No. It's not the Duke. But you make a really good point. Is, I mean, that would certainly be part of changing. It would be putting figures out there in the public who do have both sides, who do show both sides of their personality. I think there are two fundamental things we need to do to change things. One is um, that we need to help find ways for men to talk with men. And one of the things I do in the book, which I'm really... Um, pleased with is there's a chapter for men who might want to learn how to talk to other men about how to get together with a group of guys and start talking about some of these things with very sort of concrete step-by-step -step ideas about how to do that. So I think that's one. See, and I like, I, as you say that, like I get, not like the, not like nervous. a shudder, but it, yeah, and it, nervous, it just gives me right. this, like, there's no way in hell, like there, <laughs> there's, I will talk to this person, this person. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Well, you can, a, ease, you can ease into it. It's less threatening if you start it as a book group. So this is self-serving, of course. But what I suggest to people is buy the book and start a book group and start by talking about the book. And that will open into more personal conversation. Dave, send me a private message after this is all over with. I got something for you. And uh, Tom says, "You're Doc, you're one of the best guests I've ever oh, had. Thanks. Good job. Thank you, Tom. But let me tell you the second thing that has to happen. And this will surprise you. Because it's a simple thing, but it would change the world. Men have to be equal parents. Men have to be as involved emotionally. So then boys would not have all their eggs in one basket with their mom. They'd have two equal attachments to their mom and their dad and they wouldn't be as scared about their mom abandoning them because they would have their dad who they should be just as close to and that is a simple but world changing so one of the things i recommend to couples with young kids is i tell them okay mom is going out of town for the weekend and she's not allowed to set up a babysitter, cook meals in advance, set up play dates. She's not allowed to help in any way, shape, or form. 
She's just going away for the weekend to with with friends, whatever she wants to do. And the dad has to figure it out. And men are kind of afraid to figure it out because their wives are always watching and supervising and correcting. But if she goes away for the weekend, so when my wife went away, I used to call them beer and pizza weekends. You know, it's like, <laughs> I didn't worry about cooking. I didn't worry about cleaning. I just focus. And then what happens, of course, is, you know, we're not stupid. We're not incapable. You figure it out. So maybe you didn't know how to get your kids to sleep because your wife always did it. But if you got them alone for the weekend, you will figure out how to get the kids to sleep your way. And then, of course, when your wife comes back, you have to, you know, you have to figure out because some she'll do it her way and you'll do it. But that is, again, a radical life changing thing to do. So with that, like, I mean, if you like we talked a little bit about child support, we talked about some other stuff like have you ever worked within the courts with any of that stuff? I mean, to because you made the statement of the father being more present, um, like being more there. And we see so many times when a divorce happens that there still are so many what, what I'll call mother friendly states that kind of basically treat the dad as a second class citizen is a is a deadbeat is is that type of thing and i mean and i think that's hard for um i i think guys at least i know i've had it always in the back of my head during that process is no matter what i do no matter how present i am in this with the kids that if it comes down to it and there's a divorce i'm not like that, i'm gonna lose that might be true but and you're not gonna like this i want to put it back on you the tighter you are with your kids, the closer you are, the less likely that is to happen. If you go into a divorce situation and your kids are just as attached to you as they are to their mom, when the guardian ad litem interviews the kids, they're gonna say, I, I gotta be with my dad. You can't take me away from my dad. So men, in a sense, we are part of setting, we complain a lot about it, but we are part of creating that situation by not putting in the work, I, I work with, hopefully he's not listening to this interview because I'm betraying his confidence, but it's 30 years ago. So hopefully he's not listening. But he was, um, it was a completely not involved dad. And, and he was in a very ugly divorce. And he said to me, um, geez, I don't know, you know, uh, my, my wife's talking about me only having custody, you know, every other weekend. And I, you know, what would that be like? And I said, without thinking, I said, yeah, that would really be a big, a big increase in the amount of time you spent with your kids, <laughs> which would, would have been. The truth is it would have been. And so he's, he's not missing his kids. He's just involved in a power struggle with his wife. But the fact of the matter is he, he, if he spent every other weekend with his kids, it would be way more connection with them that he had from his marriage. It's just... You know, it's interesting you, you you use that term power struggle. I wonder how much when we talk about these kind of things is just that. Yeah. Because we, we are competitive in nature. You know, how how much of it is at, for men? Is it just. Yeah, it's, it's you're not the problem is time away from competitive me. in a relationship doesn't work well because because you really don't want your partner to be. A, you don't want to lose and you don't want your partner to lose. It's not it's not a good feeling to defeat somebody that you love and planning on living with. And so it's not a good model for intimate relationships. There's, there's no real room for competition. It really has to be collaborative. You have, what I tell couples is you can't, when you have a disagreement, you're not done talking until you have a solution that both people feel good about. And if you haven't found that yet, you're not done. You can't win an argument. And I, I want to, Dave just threw this up, and I think this is an example. Find your group where you can find them for men. It doesn't matter where it is. Anywhere. Church, he, OA. Yeah, absolutely. He found his through OA. Yeah. About sharing very personal experiences. And I, I think food for a lot of us becomes um, becomes that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's not drugs. It's not alcohol. It's no, I just love good food. I just really right. enjoy good food. Right. You know, I want to, and it's it's a barricade. It's a barricade yeah. for your feelings. Yeah. So, the next question then is, can we turn? Can a, an individual who, 
I, I know you're talking about opening up about our feelings and getting into that, but can can a leopard change his, his uh spot? Absolutely. So like, we haven't talked much about women, so let's bring them in the conversation. First. Please. I did a workshop for men and women, and it was an unusual format. We met for two days, and then we didn't meet again for four months, and we met for two more days. And what was interesting was the women had made more changes in their relationships than the men over those four months. And the reason is that it was life changing for the women because when, when their partners are withdrawing and entrenching and getting defensive, women interpret that as a power struggle. They're pulling my chain. They're, they're just trying to jerk me around. When they understand that that withdrawal is because the man is intimidated and overwhelmed, it changes and softens their whole perspective. So let me read you a quote from a woman at the second meeting of that group. So this is, you know, a real person. She said, um, I understand that my husband has not been ignoring, dismissing or hurting me out of a lack of respect as I assumed he had been, but that he's scared of me. He's scared to hurt me. He's scared to mess up with me. He's scared to not be enough. And I honestly never imagined that he was scared and that I was so profoundly important to him that he was constantly terrified I would leave him. So this work and this book can be as life-changing for women and so what some couples are doing, which I think is great, is they, they buy the book and they read a chapter at a time. And then they, they read chapter one and then they talk about it. They don't read ahead. And then they read chapter two and they talk about it. And the reason it really helps, you know, women don't, they, they find us a complete mystery. And so they're dying to read something that helps them understand their partner. And so they read the book together and the guys are saying, right there, chapter three, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Yeah, that's what it's like for me. And they're like, oh, okay, I get, you know, it like it gives language for the men to explain to their partners what's going on with them. And it, again, it's, it's a very powerful thing to read it together. So it's a great Christmas gift. For your partner <laughs> well well and, and we can all find now is that christmas gift avail, available on it your is, website doc it's you can find the link on the website or just go to amazon and you'll find it because you've now i, I was going to ask is this now is this hidden in plain sight what yes. is it so yes. that's hidden, well, that's in plain hidden in plain sight okay how men's fears of women shape their intimate relationships okay because i wasn't sure because you've got hidden in plain sight living and loving mutually change happens and yeah. um experimental psychotherapy oh the other thing by the way is if you go to the website so i do a, i write a lot of columns online for psychology today if you sign up for the mailing list you'll get all those columns and you'll get a free ebook hey <laughs> but love it I, I mean the stuff we're talking about here i, I mean to i i always felt like you know and i've like Women are very open. You you said it because they're taught to to care about their feelings. Yeah. They're taught that those things matter. They're co taught to be in touch and to, and to carry those emotions. Um, what are some of the and, and, and I I want to kind of get this little hint from you because you said there's a chapter inside the book about for men to kind of yeah. kind of get into these things. But what are some of the biggest barriers? And in my mind, I think it's me for men to go and join one of these groups and, and I'll make it twofold. What's one of the barriers for joining it? And do you think it's better for men to join a group or to do one-on-one? -on -one? I think, um, I mean, when I work with men, I work with them individually and then I put them in a group and I, I do that just to sort of help them get warmed up and opened up to the, where they're ready to be in a group. I very rarely start someone in a group, but the biggest obstacle for men is fear. The biggest obstacle is that they'll be found out that other well, yeah. guys I mean, will realize. Go ahead. Absolutely. When you were just talking about, like, like you were saying, when you were saying like, Oh no, like immediately I got nervous. Yeah. Like, you're 100% inside yeah. of me. I'm like, no, like that, right. that has no appeal to me. Right. I'm just going to, let the squirrels die so that I can log off real quick before I, I throw up in my mouth. 
I have, I have an entire career of working with men exactly like you. I have a practice full of guys who never in a million years imagined that they would ever talk to a therapist. And now it's a, you know, it's a really important part of their lives. I, my men's groups, one of my men's groups, I, I go to a conference three times a year, Wednesday through Friday, Wednesday through Sunday. And the group was meeting on Thursdays. And the group changed the meeting day to get three more meetings a year. Wow. See, that's, and that's, and that's awesome. And I consider myself like I, and maybe I'm like some other guy, but I consider myself fairly like hard on my sleeve. Like I can talk about stuff and all that, but just the thought, like thinking about it. Yeah. It just, no. <laughs> I, think I think you'll find that within the first 30 minutes that would change. Yeah. It, and I get like, a horrible it, person yeah. because it feels so good. Yeah. I just had one of my oldest friends here, probably friends for 40 years. And, um, you know, we just sat and talked for hours and hours and hours, and it was wonderful. It's just a great, it's, it's different talking to a man than it is talking to a woman. We understand each other. And it's it's so funny that, bringing it back full circle to the beginning of the show, as Dibs was saying that, you talked about when I made the joke with my wife, and, you know, hey, mm -hmm. we make a joke about things we're scared of. Dibs is, is really opening up and saying this, and the first thing that came to mind to me was like it's because you're a bitch because i was going to make fun of him <laughs> right 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 and exactly i was only going to do that because because you're uncomfortable right because you're yeah. nervous damn so i gotta embrace this you gotta embrace this you gotta embrace this suck got it <laughs> i wanted to call the book but they wouldn't let me pussy with why wouldn't they that book would have sold a billion copies just because i wanted I to call the book and right in the first chapter i posed the question that says pussy whipped why is it that the worst insult one man can say about another, think about it, it's that you need a woman, that you need a woman, that that's the most insulting thing one man can say to another is that he needs a woman. Absolutely. Because it's crazy because, of course, it's true. And so we're shaming people and humiliating them for something that they, that it's true. I'm better with my wife. A hundred percent promise you that I'm better with my wife. Well, I'm happy for you. That's great. Yeah. And I mean, like even looking at that, like you were just saying, Sean, like to automatically want to say like something. So, and just the guy, so I'm in a group with uh, four other Marines that we've all been like really good friends through all that. And when we, we all say like, love you to each other, but there's always some connotation at the end of it. Like, Oh, I love you asshole. Like just something. Cause I feel like if we didn't say that, like that's that negative aspect that we're so it's so ingrained, especially being and, military. And into our bodies. The, the guys in my groups look, look each other in the eyes and say, I love you. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that is huge. Like that I is such a, that. I've always been an I love you. But see, I, so have I. Yeah. Now, going back, God, because Doc, I could talk to you for hours. I don't know how much time you got, but like this is like <laughs> one of those most fascinating. I'm having my own group session right now. And it, it is opening listen. out of the NBA season. I'm going to watch the Hawks game. So we got to stop at some point. Hey, you know what? <laughs> you you should have, then you should come and visit us in Albany because uh, one of your former number one draft picks went to Shen High School. Uh, oh, like, yeah. Uh, what was the redheaded kid's name? Uh, Herder, Kevin Herder. Yeah, he was. He went to Shen High School, uh, oh, okay. right right here locally. Right down the road. Yeah, yeah like yeah, he, now, nobody he's... post on the score of the game on this scroll here. Don't anybody give away the score. <laughs> we'll get, we'll here. get the score on the scroll. Okay. So we've got the four books that that people can find, and they're on your yeah. your website. And I'm going to spell the website because I know we were joking about how I butcher names, and it's nothing personal. Everyone knows it, but it's A V R U M W E I S S phd.com you can find all doc stuffs on there you can find his books on there you can also find him on uh linkedin under avram a avram did i get it right this avram, avram. avram. Oh God. like avram levine why can somebody just say like avram levine avram. <laughs> uh look and i love this no one wins this will sit with me I, absolutely dibs or uh tom but uh See, I'll take credit for his comment. Yeah. A a Avram uh, Weiss on uh, LinkedIn. You can find Doc there. You can reach out to him. If you're in Maine, uh, almost in Canada, you can find him there. Uh, uh, 
I'll tell you you only need a seaplane. You only need a seaplane, a you boat, do, you the compass, and the I, crystal skull. I will tell you one thing I, I am very proud of. Um, I answer every email. I, well, that's I, awesome. That's awesome. If you email me and you don't hear back, there's only one explanation. I didn't get your email. Or I died. One, <laughs> well, let's, died go the email. let's go with email. the email. Let's go with the email aspect first, Doc. Let's go with yeah. that one. <laughs> Like, but I, I just hate it when I email people and they don't answer me. And so I've promised myself I, and, and I will answer. I mean, I won't just, you know, give you some three, three word answer. If you ask me a question, I'll answer it. I mean, it, it's just, it's, I really hope that every man that listens to this, you know, picks up the phone and calls another dude that you consider as yeah. your friend. Yeah. It, I think and that'd be great. And, and just call them and say, uh, and it's interesting because I'm not going to put out who, but I have someone who's extremely close to me. And I always, cause I feel this way about them. I always every time, Hey, I love you. And they will never say it back because it's a man thing. And, and they've got, and I, I say it all the time. And maybe after this, after hearing this, they'll start realizing that I come from an, my, my father, even though with the last name of Murphy, we come from an Italian household. My grandma was the first person. And I always felt like our household was a very loving household. Like, especially my grandmother, men, yeah. men kissed each other. We didn't care about that. That wasn't That's a great. big deal. You hugged each other. It wasn't a big deal. Um, it, it's just so incredible. Doc, I can feel like I could talk to you for hours. Like I, I said, I feel we'll like another gonna, interview. We'll come, we'll, <laughs> we'll do it again. We're going to have to do this it's again. It's awesome. I mean, it's, it's even when you said like to think, like go and think through your friends. I think it's a good opportunity to really think through who you consider friends. Cause I, I know there's a lot of people that I'm like, Oh yeah. Like uh, it's definitely my friend. And then I sit there and like, eh, maybe an acquaintance, like, and it's not someone that I could have that conversation with. So I think this is a good thing. One to really evaluate how you do feel, but two to find really who your inner circle is. Like they say, as you grow, your inner circle shrinks. Yeah, and I, and, and and I, think, that's I true. think what Sean's saying is important too, which is not just to identify, but then to maybe stretch it a little bit, you know, to push mm -hmm. the border a little bit and be a little more, try being a little more open and seeing, you know, because every man I talk to says, oh, I'd really like to have a close male friend, but no, none of the other guys are interested. Well, they can't all be the... <laughs> I think there are a lot of men who are interested, but they just don't know that other guys are interested too. Yep. Absolutely. And so it, it's, so doc, it, it, do you have any other upcoming tours? I know you said you do a lot of conferences. Any I, other I'll, I'll tell you something I'm doing that people might be interested in. And, and again, email me if you are, I'm doing a workshop. I'm, I'm just starting to do it for men and women on helping men and women understand each other better. And the format of the workshop is, you guys, I don't know if you remember this TV show, but you remember the, the TV show, The Newlywed Game? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I use the format of The Newlywed Game, and I ask questions about relationships of the men and the women, and I have them write their answers down. And then I ask the man what they think women think, and of course, they're wrong. And then I ask women what they think men think, and of course, they're wrong. And so it's a fun way of learning about each other more and understanding what makes us tick. That's incredible. That's so awesome. It's fun. I, I, you need to connect them with self. Any, you know, any yeah. group of people anywhere. That doesn't have to be, you know, they're not therapists or whatever, just, you know, at a church or a Lions Club or anywhere. Well, I, we would we would love to have you in the well, Albany. I can drive to Albany. I just have to get the boat first. So you, you got to get the boat to get across to everything. Rent a room and get some people together and we'll have some fun. Uh, I I think I, I I know the church that I belong to, I think would love it because we actually it's one of the only ones that I've ever been part of. We actually have men's groups oh, that's great. That's great. That, that get together and they do stuff. And uh, I'm going men into a, a men's group at a synagogue in uh, in a few weeks. I'm really looking forward to it. They they contacted me and I'm going to come in, you know, join one of their meetings on Zoom. So, well, yeah, I'll be happy to come. That would be amazing. You and I will stay in touch. I'll, I'll Sounds good. Be in co contact with the right people. I think uh, okay. th this would be amazing. So we've got that. We've got the four the four books. Everybody needs to go buy at least four copies of each book, so that okay. so that Doc can get that seaplane that we can joke <laughs> around about. But you don't but, uh, you don't know anything about publishing if you think that selling books makes money. Oh no, <laughs> we just recently had a guy on who. Um, published like eight books he did the uh guys and i'm 
gonna I can't remember the name right now. He actually interviewed. Do you remember back in the seventies the guy that disappeared for a, over a year and then just like reappeared? I think so yeah. Um, yeah. Can't think of his name. We actually interviewed uh, his, the, inter- the guy we interviewed was D- uh, Dylan Quarles has a book coming out where he actually mm. interviewed the guy. He knew where he was at, huh. and, but he t- talks about the publishing of it and how these publishing houses, That's unless true. you're, yeah. he's like, unless you know somebody or you're somehow famously related, they won't even talk to you. No, it's true. Most of the way I reach people is like this. It's why I do these interviews because people don't read. Yeah, and, and Doc, you are incredible. I, I definitely look forward to keeping Thanks. this going along. Sounds good. Sure, again, everybody gets out there and, and gets Doc stuff, reads reads up on it. Please, nobody give them the uh, score for the Hawks game. Who are they opening? <laughs> who are they opening a season against? They're playing. Um, I knew until you asked me. Of course, I uh, they Houston. Ah, uh, no, they'll win. Yeah, I, I don't think Houston's got anybody anymore. Those no, days. Don't. They know. There's days of Houston. There's always a great thing about basketball that uh, Jim Ro- that Jim Rome said. Basketball is like one of the only sports you only need one, no more than two superstars on a team and a bunch of role players, and you can win an NBA championship. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> that's all. That's all you need. Yeah, who, we'll who see. the Hawks got now? Who, who the Hawks got now? Well, they, got, they got Trey Young. Yeah. 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 There's a superstar right there for yeah. you. So. Again, folks, if, if you're liking what you're hearing, you're liking what you're seeing, make sure you subscribe to uh, all the locations where we're at, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, TikTok, all of them, even our email, the Above the Bar podcast. Make sure you send us a sticker. Go search out Dibs. Give him a follow. If you're looking for your media to get better, remember, if you tell him belly up to the bar, he's going to give you a 10% discount on your first order on your media and a free consultation. So make sure you're reaching out to Dibs. Uh, Dibs, you got anything coming up everybody needs to know about? Anything going on with the uh, Gaylord Snow? Uh, yeah, Gaylord Snow season kicks off this weekend. Uh, we're away, yeah, and hot. then uh, and then uh, first home game is the 29th. So we've got some – so funny enough, uh, one of our players is actually the former CEO of the Dollar Beard Club. Oh, Dollar really? Shave Club, one of them, Chris Stoikos. Yeah, he's on Shark Tank and stuff quietest guy here you go quietest guy like never but is the most like receptive like would come up and like give me a hug like oh hey what's up dude like nicest guy in the world but you would never never think of it but yeah so no our season kicks off yeah so follow the snow uh, it'll be a good season all right doc don't log at off right away because i gotta okay. talk to you for one second afterwards uh but we have one rule on the show the guest always gets the last the last word always uh, my last word is an appreciation for you guys. Anytime I see men speaking in a real way with each other, um, I feel like that's the work. I feel like that's what we need to be doing. And, and it can happen a lot of different ways. So kudos to you guys. You know, having real conversations between men is really what we need to be doing. All righty, folks. Be sure to push your stool in. This has been an Earplug Podcast presentation found on EarplugPodcast.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, and wherever your favorite podcasts are found.